Today, we're yeah. going to go over some of the basic stuff for marshalling. To keep the time frame down, we're going to work primarily on the different armor and weapons requirements that there are in the SCA and the Kingdom of Ontir. Um, we're going to go over how to conduct an, a field inspection of a fighter. And then we'll go over to our little mock Eric and do a little bit of, as a marshal, how do you marshal on the field? And what are some of the things to do and not to do? And with the situation in the world today, to be a little bit safer, I put the armor on myself and I have Lord COVID here is gonna help me do some of the inspection stuff back here also. So let's talk first about what is a marshal there to do? A marshal is there to help safely get people onto the field, to make sure that the fighters are wearing the equipment that's safe by the minimum standards of the society and a kingdom of volunteer for them to go on the field and safely conduct themselves in a chivalric manner. We are there as kind of a crowd control on the field. Our job is to make sure that the populace stays off the turning field or the war field and that the fighters stay on the turning or the war field. And keep, no, never shall the two meet each other, hopefully. It goes badly that way. Marshall's there to help with the showmanship, the pageantry that is the society. It's not necessarily about the marshals, but the marshals, especially in a, in a major tournament, are part of it. It's part of the atmosphere that people see. What are we not there for? We are not there to stop injuries from happening. All right, you can do everything right and people are gonna get injured. All right, it's a sport that's very nature is going to have injuries. What we are trying to do as marshals is to prevent life-changing injuries. Those injuries to the neck, the head, the joints, the groin, things that can have an alterating effect to the individual for life. That's our main thing, and that's the main reason why the standards are there, is to stop those injuries from happening. We're not there to call the fight. Marshals in, in Ontario do not determine who the winner is. The fighters determine who the winner is. We, we don't necessarily interject ourselves into the fight. There's a thing, if you look in ABCs, about fair witness. And while you can, if asked, you can always give your opinion on what you've seen. But for the most part, the honor is on the fighters. So we try to leave it on to the fighters unless there's a major issue. And then at that point, hopefully, a member of the chivalry at night or the crown or the representatives of the crown will step in to deal with the problem. You are there though that if attitudes go bad on the field, if something disastrous happens, whether accident, injury, attitude, something like that, to give an honest and neutral feedback to the marshal in charge, the Earl Marshal, or the Crown, if necessary, should something like that happen. So those are the things that marshals are there and there not to do. So now we'll kind of go into the different requirements for this stuff. I'm going to read a lot of the stuff I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of read a little bit out of the, the ABCs for Ontario, just so you get an idea of of how the words speak is, and then we'll go over it on the different materials that I have around here. Always be willing to ask questions as a marshal. The, the ABCs can be confusing and they can even be contradictive sometimes. Always be willing to ask questions uh, to the branch marshals, the armored marshal, the earl marshal, or people like myself that you know that have spent a lot of time in it. Um, 
because I was the uh, armored combat marshal for for two years and the Earl Marshal of the Kingdom for four. So I'm always there for help and trying to determine how it is. And even even at this point, having been part of somebody that read the rules, sometimes you have to get with the other marshals and go, what do you think? Because they can be somewhat contradictory. Before I start, there is one thing that I want to go over. You will see in the ABCs them talk about rigid protection. You'll see that a lot in a lot of the descriptions. And I don't think it necessarily gives you an exact meaning of what rigid protection is. So let's start with that. Rigid protection means something like metal, plastic, or heavy leather with padding. So an armor grade padding like this with a heavy leather, that would be considered a rigid padding. In the ABCs, it starts out first with the helms. Helms should be constructed from steel, which has a thickness of no less than 1 16th of an inch or 16 gauge or of equivalent material. If you use something like stainless steel, brass, bronze, those things have to have a much thicker density to them than normal steel. 16 is the minimum, but most of the time on helms you'll see that as 14 and 12 gauge. So for people who don't understand metal gauges, the smaller the number means it's thicker, not thinner, which is a little bit different than what most people are used to, to thinking about. The mass of the helm is an important part of the project Chin. As such, no titanium, fiberglass, aluminum, or other ultralight materials may be used unless they meet the equivalent mass strength and weight of steel. A lot of people ask, why don't we use titanium for helmets? It's nice and light and it's super strong. The reason being is that as the rattan hits the helmet, the mass of the steel allows the blow to deflect outwards. Titanium is a metal that's super strong because of its lightness will focus the blow inward onto the person with the possibility of causing an injury. So what they're saying is that mass of the helm is a major importance on keeping you from getting a head injury. All joints or seams shall be constructed in one or a combination of the following ways with all wheels sound and rivet secure. Basically what they're getting at is that a helmet has to be either welded together or it has to be riveted together with steel or iron rivets and those steel and iron rivets have to be no less than two and a half inches away from each other. If you look at this helm, this is this is mine and it's more of a welded helm with decorative rivets around it. Where these helms here have the rivets going across to keep the pieces together. In some helms, I've seen them use brass rivets in the structure, even though normally you don't, but at that point they're within one inch of each other. And the amount of mass of the different plates that they're putting together makes the helm more of an eight gauge instead of a 12 gauge. So it's actually thicker than what it needs to be to make the helm safe. Bars used in the face guard shall be steel of not less than 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter or equivalent. If the span between the crossbars is less than two inches, then they can use one eighth of an inch diameter bars may be used. And then the face guard, the bars have to be within one inch of each other. So all of these bars, you can't put anything smaller than an inch through there. The reason being as we go along, you'll see that the swords are made to be an inch and a quarter thick. That way the, the swords will not penetrate the grills. Again, the steel thickness is, is to help with the construction. Um, a lot of people have started going away from the bar grills and going into the more fancy 
water jet or laser cut face pieces. All parts of the helmet might cause injurious contact with the wearer's head shall be padded with a minimum of half an inch of closed cell foam or equivalent padding or shall be suspended in such a way that any part that might come in contact with the wearer's neck or, oh, it's a little messed up here. So basically, it's a requirement to have a half an inch of closed cell foam inside your helmet in the areas which touch your head. The closed cell foam can come in very different ways. A lot of it is like this type of foam that you can buy, the EVA foam. It's dense, it's thick, you can't see through it. And as it compresses, it comes back. A lot of people now are using the military style pads, a little bit thicker. They also have a tendency to last a lot longer. You will see other people use martial arts helmets, rugby helmets, anything that has the solid closed cell foam in there. Uh, the reason being is that you need that, that compression as, the, as it, the helmet's hit with the steel, you want that pad compression to keep from that helm bottoming out into the person's head. And it has to be done with a closed cell foam. Open will allow it to compress too thin and then pop back out, which can cause injury. The face guard shall extend at least one inch below the bottom of the chin and the jawline. So like on here, on the person's chin, it has to extend down below. That with the neck protection as we get in later, we'll make sure that nothing can get in there to hit the person. Um, the helmets also must have a chin strap, at least a half an inch wide coming in into a chin cup. You can't just have a snug fit. There has to be something in there that holds the helmet to the, the body so that the helmet can't be ripped off the head. That kind of is the majority on helms. Um, when we go into inspections, we'll go a little bit more about looking on the inside, some of the other issues that you can run into um, with the helms, but that focuses on the main parts. We'll go into the neck. The neck, including the larynx, the cervical vertebrae, and the first thoracic vertebrae must be covered by one or a combination of the following and must stay covered during typical combat situations, including the turning and moving of the, the head and neck. Either the helmet itself, a heavy camel or abin tail, that hangs or drapes to absorb the force of the blow. If you're using, if the person is using this, if the camel or admin tail lays in contact with the larynx, cervical vertebrae, or first thoracic vertebrae, then those areas have to be padded with at least a quarter inch of closed cell foam. Also, a collar of heavy leather lying with a minimum of one quarter inch of closed cell foam or equivalent. Right here, my normal gorget, heavy leather, foam. It protects here and protects down the back. The first thoracic vertebrae is what we lovingly refer to as the off button. If you take a nice hit back there, a lot of times, It'll feel like you just stuck your finger in the light socket and it can really just shut a person off fast. That's one of the big areas when you're inspecting a person is to look at that neck protection. Not too many people that have a camel and Avon tail go with just a padded deal. Most of them still to this day wear a gorget, which is the better idea because the movement and the turning, it's very hard to actually keep the padding in the right spot. But technically, by the society rules, you don't have to wear a gorget if you follow the rules with the camel and tail. But most fighters that I deal with, I highly 
stress not to do that to where a gorget is possible uh, the neck is one of those areas on your body that you really don't want to take a hard hit to especially a nice thrust from a, a large weapon body armor is not required by the society in ontario except for a very specific area and that's the kidney area and the, and the floating ribs they said it shall be covered with a minimum of heavy leather worn over a quarter inch of closed cell foam or equivalent padding. Now, if you look in the book, it's going to tell you a thing about Zoom Bang. Zoom Bang is this material that's very flexible until it's hit and then it goes rigid. It was introduced a few years back and we had found that as an armor piece, it didn't necessarily work because it didn't always go rigid right at the time you needed to. So you were getting hit with soft padding instead of basically armor. But the society has allowed that to be there for this area only. And later on, we get into inspecting, you realize that a lot of people don't understand what padding the kidney and the short ribs are. You see them wear a belt a lot of times where my short ribs are clear up to here. So there to my waist is a, is a fair distance. So the kidney protection actually has to have a fairly large size to it. Hand protection. So hand protection can be done in different ways. You do it by steel, plastic, or heavy leather gauntlets that completely enclose the hand, protect the fingers. They have to have a certain amount, uh, a quarter inch of closed cell foam or equivalent behind them where they will hit. You can use heavy leather lined with a half an inch of closed cell foam or heavy padding. Uh, a lot of people will use hockey gloves, which are fine as long as there are no modern logos being shown. Um, other ways are a basket hilt and a demi gauntlet. So a basic demi gauntlet, normally they would have to be lined with a quarter inch of closed cell foam behind them. I use a very padded tactical glove or mechanics glove because the way that I set my basket up so that I can throw, I have the ability to protect my hand here and there. And I make sure that I come up with an idea so that if I get hit, I don't have any worries there. And that fulfills the requirement for hand protection. You want to make sure that the wrist is well covered. Most of your gauntlets, the demi gauntlets, are going to have a bell around it to help protect in there. As you'll see in the next one, arm armor, there really is no requirement for arms except for the elbows. Elbows are normally rigid material, metal, plastic, foil, carboid, leather. If you're using with a quarter inch of closed cell foam or equivalent padding. Most people just use elbow pads, normal ones that you use for like volleyball. This armor shall be tested such a way that the elbow remains covered during combat. The thing, one thing about that though is, is on this particular shield, a heater shield, there is a rule that if my elbow is greater than four inches from the edge of a shield, I don't have to wear an elbow cup on the shield. I don't necessarily agree with that rule, but that's a society rule. If you see a person come up with a heater shield and then you can get four inches away from their elbow to the edge of the shield, they don't have to have the elbow cup. The elbow cups have to be, again, rigid material. They have to cover the side areas of it where your elbow bends so that you don't take the strikes 
on the edges. Um, some people use a very wide wing. Some people use a narrow wing. The major thing is, is that it covers the points of the bend and covers the elbow even in the movement. Like here with mine, it's strapped to the elbow pads so that it follows the elbow all the time across here and keeps the sides covered. So we'll go over shields a little bit. Shields will be made of different materials, wood, plastic, metal. The edges need to be covered. You don't want raw edging. This one's mine, it's wood, and we use uh, rawhide to cover the edges. It needs to have ways to protect the hand. There's no protrusions, as you see, everything's down here. You can't have a, a protrusion. Uh, I think it's more than three eighths of an inch off of here. You'll see a lot of people use on their shields uh, bolts. You don't want the bolts and the nuts sticking out at a high point. It has a tendency to catch weapons, catch armor, catch skin. That's another thing to look for as you're going through different shields. The heater shield here, of course, was aluminum. Has a handle here to protect the hand. So technically, this would be enough for somebody using this that they wouldn't need a gauntlet or demi gauntlet strapped here. Now, on a center grip on a shield like this, also has the rule that if the hand to the wrist is more than four inches away from the shield, they don't have to have hand protection. They don't have to have a demi gauntlet or a gauntlet. So this one would qualify for that. My buckler on the other hand is way too small. So I would have to have hand protection while using the shield out there fighting. All right, let's talk about weapons. On a weapon, except for in the hilt, the guards, the pommels, if this had a normal, you can't have any metal in this part of the sword, only back where the handle is. Single-handed weapons, she'll have a wrist strap or equivalent restraint, which will keep the weapon from leaving the immediate area of the user if released during any part of the combat. So basically, all swords must have a, a trigger design that your hands can, fingers can go into, or a lanyard that will keep the sword from going anywhere. Because the last thing you want in a tournament is a fighter out there fighting and all of a sudden, there goes the sword. So you are required to have something to help keep the sword in your hand. The striking surfaces of all weapons, including the tip, shall be wrapped in a manner that allows no rattan to show. All thrusting tips and striking heads must be securely attached to the weapon. Basically, by the rules, swords must be taped with tape, or in my case, mine is covered with rawhide. One of the worst things you'll see a lot of people when you're at a tournament is people not taping up their swords. Again, let's go. Yes. So, as we talked before, the grill of a helm. The distance between the bars can be no bigger than an inch. A sword can be no smaller than an inch and a quarter. That way it helps keep the, the weapon from entering the grill. Thrusting tips, you have to have a progressive give across the whole surface. It has to be half an inch thick, I think it is. Now, a lot of people will go, well, something's a little too stiff and you would rather have the thrusting tip be a little bit stiffer than a little bit looser because if it's too loose, the thrusting tip has a tendency to roll and then you hit your opponent with the rattan. Now the book goes into two different types of weapons. They go into the single-handed weapons like your swords, 
uh, your small maces, your small hand axes, and then your two-handed weapons, like the great swords here that I have. So we'll go over a couple little things. Weapons shall be constructed of rattan. So everybody should know at this point, here's rattan, natural material. We use it because when it breaks down, it turns into fibers and dust, not into splinters. So we don't have protrusions that can go into people's eyes or into their body is the main reason why rattan was chosen over other materials. Again, weapons shall not shown be not less than 1.25 inches in total diameter, including the tape. What that means is, is that you could technically plane the sword down to an inch and then tape it back up to an inch and a quarter. You will see that people will do that because it reduces the weight of the sword and the, they can use the tape to help balance the sword out because rattan being a natural product has a tendency to be heavier, lighter, depending on the batch of rattan that you get into. So there's a section in here that's gonna talk about Siloflex. Siloflex is basically the type of tubing that you would use for home irrigation projects in like flower bed. It's very restrictive about how Siloflex can be used. And I don't think I've seen a Siloflex sword on the field in over 10 years. The, the restrictions aren't worth it for most people to use it. So you will probably never see that on the field at all, but it's still left in here because other kingdoms than on tier still use plastic Siloflex on their swords or actually do use plastic um, swords but those are not allowed in on tier because of the cold up here. We had, a, had problems with them shattering and breaking. So you won't see those solid plastic swords, but if you go to some of the big out of kingdom events, you might actually see those on the field. If the weapon has a head, it shall not be constructed of solely rigid materials. Semi-rigid heads are allowed. The head shall be firmly and securely attached to the half. The head shall allow at least a half inch of progressive gear. So if you're making an ax, it can't be a solid piece of rattan. You have to have something on the front that gives a little bit of give, a little bit of padding like just like the thrusting tips on the sword. No weapon may have a cutting and or smashing surface at both ends. Basically a single, single handed weapons, you can't put a thrusting tip on the end of your sword. A lot of people go, oh great, I can, no, you can't do that. You can only have it on one end of the sword. And then they shall be taped or otherwise covered in a manner that allows no rattan splinters to protrude. Now, as you look in there, there are sections in the, in the ABCs that says that you can't use materials that change the flexibility of rattan. This is a contradiction into itself because this, the society says you also have to tape your swords. You can't go out with a bare sword. Tape changes the flexibility of rattan. A lot of kingdoms outside of Ontario don't allow rawhide on their swords because they think it changes the flexibility of it too much. But I have pictures of my swords flexing going around people. So it's kind of a gray area and it's one of those weird contradictions that you just have to get used to. The main thing that they talk about when you can't change the flexibility is back in the old days when the society first started, people to get more life out of the rattan would suck wood glue through the rattan or other materials to make it more rigid. That of course basically turns that piece of rattan into an iron bar. Um, I've seen people core rattan and put rigid pieces in there like steel or something else. Um, so it's different materials like that. Um, another thing I've seen is individuals would take um, leather and put tape leather down the striking surface and then tape over it. 
that right there now makes a very hard distinct point and when you hit a helm it has a tendency to dent the helm because now you've taken it you've made the sword not only more rigid but you've lessened the striking surface and the smaller the striking surface the more force that striking surface has when it hits the helm so those are little things once we get into um, inspections to look for two-handed weapons Weapons shall be constructed of rattan of not less than an inch, 1.25 inches, an inch and a quarter in diameter, including tape. Whole arms may contain blades constructed of split rattan so long as the pieces are securely fastened to the weapon. Um, this is one where you have a pole arm and we can tell that the main piece of the rattan here is round and then there's a split piece of rattan here that's taped together to it. It's securely fastened so that it won't come off um, and it's taped in an appropriate manner. Needs a little bit of retaping, but it's there. The weapon shall not be excessively flexible. Basically what they're saying is that some rattan on the larger two-handed weapons, if you get enough flexibility, you can basically crack it like a whip and that flexibility um, will cause a much more excessive hit because you're basically turning a pole weapon like this into a bull whip made out of rattan. The head shall allow at least half inch of progressive give between the striking surface and the semi-rigid ultralight shaped foam heads or a laminated or basically, again, the thrusting tips have to have the progressive give at least a half an inch. This one's not too bad, as you can see. And when you're inspecting, you can't just do it with your thumb. You need to kind of put together and compress down evenly to see how it compresses. Mine might be a little bit stiff, but again, I'd rather have them a little bit more on the stiff side. I think it's a lot safer. Oh yeah. So one thing also to put in there that I forgot about, Single-handed weapons can weigh no more than five pounds. Two-handed weapons can weigh no more than six pounds. And people think, well, that's a lot. Well, not necessarily on a single-handed weapon. Yeah, that could be a bit much, but if you're using a steel basket hilt, you can grab a pound or two real fast. My great sword here has a metal pommel, metal quillions, so you can get to six pounds pretty quickly. You don't want weapons much heavier than that because that just equates more force and more chance of hurting somebody. One thing I didn't go over was leg armor. The only thing that's required on the legs is coverage of the knees. It's, this, it's basically the same as elbows. Rigid material, plastic, metal, heavy leather. It has to have quarter inch foam behind it. Again, most people use a knee pad. The knees have to stay in place as the person moves. So as they go down on their knees, as they come back up, and they also have to make sure that they cover the side points on the, on the side of the knee here. And they should also be clearly marked. So with mine being underneath my pants, the pet, the, extra covering I hear for wearing out makes the line of my knee because on a legal target, it is um, one inch above the knee and higher is where you can strike. Anything below that is not a legal target. So again, basically the same requirements as your elbow cups and your arm armor. I can't stress that if you're at an event and you're working as a marshal, having a written copy of the ABCs with you at all times is always a great thing to have. You're going to get people that are going to try to contradict what you're saying, or you may not know the exact answer, and no marshal can ever know everything in the ABCs. I help write these, and I still can't remember everything that's in them, but I know where to look to find it. So, don't be afraid to ask those questions. Thank you. Let's see, I think that covers 
the majority of the things that we have to look at with weapon standards. Again, look over things. If you have questions, please be free to contact me and ask um, if things don't seem right. I know it's kind of a fast go over tonight, but I don't want to overload people too much. And I definitely want people to read and try to understand the ABCs as much as they can. Now we're going to start trying to go into uh, armor inspections. Having a basic knowledge of what's going on with the armor requirements, an idea of what should and shouldn't be. You're out on the field, they start doing armor inspections. Armor inspections, the fighter comes up to you, always try to come up with the plan. You can start from the top and work yourself down, bottom, work yourself up, come into a way that you can remember how to do your inspection every time. Normally, person comes up, the first thing I do is I grab their weapons, I check their weapons, I make sure that they have a trigger or a lanyard, everything's clean. If they have a thrusting tip, does it have the progressive give that they need? Shield, check the shield. I wanna make sure that it's not all cracked and it's not broken. It's got an edging around it. There's nothing hard protruding. There's nothing major protruding out that's gonna catch somebody or hurt somebody. Everything's solid. The handle is in tight, whether it's a center grip or a heater, and that everything seems correct with the construction. Sometimes you'll get people that'll have shields that are a little bit beat up, have some tape on it. As long as it's not something that you can see is going to go exploding in the middle of a tournament, a little bit of duct tape holding things on doesn't look pretty, but it's not going to hurt anything. After that, I want to look at the helm. Helms are required to be inspected on and off the individual. Now, this of course is not sitting perfectly, but when I'm when I'm looking at this and on tier and stuff, you see a lot of people they'll they'll grab the helm and they'll go push on it. They want to see, make sure that the helmet's not moving or it's not touching anything. I don't care if this helmet sits there and touches their nose. What, I, what I'm more worried about is does the helmet move before everything else does? If this thing is set and it's tight and it's not moving, everything should go together. The other thing that I'm looking for, more importantly, is rotational. This. What will happen is, is if the chin straps are not set up right or they're not constructed correctly or if the padding is not right in there, when a person takes a hit, the helmet will flex and it will pivot and that'll catch you right here on that nose. Also is the side to side movement. More concussion injuries come from the rotation and the movement and they come from the impact. Impact is not the major thing that you're worrying about. You're worrying about the rotational force on the individual. Again, at that point then, whether they have the helmet on or off, you go with either one. So let's say he had his helmet, I would ask for the helmet to come off. There are a lot of people who have balked at having to look at the helm off the head. But once the society brought that rule into place, it's amazing how many bad padded helms we found. Helms that had old padding, the wrong padding. One guy had shape skin padded in his helm. Here's a perfect example that is not a correctly padded helm. That, while closed cell foam, 
will probably not do a whole lot stuck together with cheap open cell foam and duct tape. I would not let this one on the field. The other things when you're looking inside there is you're checking, you don't want anything sticking out on the person. As long as that's covered, you should be all right. But the welds, the rivets inside, are the rivets loose? If I can sit here and rattle and spin a helmet that's riveted together, there's a problem with that. Anything that can protrude and hit the face, any areas like that. Not knowing that when I was a new fighter, the first helm I had, had a bar that was welded on the inside, not the outside like it was sh should be. And the first time I took a good hit, I ended up with blood running down there because I didn't know better and the person hadn't inspected it correctly. You want to pay attention to the chin straps. People have a tendency to let their chin straps go for a long time because they can be a little bit of a pain to build. A few years back at a nursing home attorney, Sir Olin Olfordson was fighting Duke Cedric. Sir Owen ducked to try to get out of a blow, and as he did, Cedric's shot stripped Owen's helm right off of his head because his chin strap broke, and before he could stop the blow, Duke Cedric hit Sir Owen in the head. Bare head. If it had been anybody other than Owen, I don't know if he'd be here right now. I was the marshal that inspected Sir Owen that day, and I didn't look at his helmet off of his head. You don't want to be the person that inspects a friend of yours and then watch him get injured. We're trying to do what we can in any way to get their people's armor fixed so that they can get on the field. But there's going to be that time where you have to tell them, no, you don't get to play until this is fixed. So something to remember about that. After I've got done with the helm, I'd be checking the neck. I'd see that their gorget is good, making sure that the back of the, the vertebrae here is all covered, it's taken care of. He's not gonna take a bad hit down here. When you inspect a person, you do not reach around them. We had an issue when I was their own marshal, some inappropriate touching. So it is a rule now that you never reach around a person to inspect them. So if you're going to go for inspecting the, the kidney and the short rib protection, you either ask the fighter to turn around or you walk around and check it yourself. Fighters understand that there is a minimum amount of physical contact that's going to be involved with an inspection. But that physical contact needs to be at a minimum, all right? You're not, you don't need to be grabby. You need to be specific on exactly what you're doing when you're trying to inspect somebody. At that point, I check their arms, make sure that the wings are all correct, make sure things are moving. If somebody was like me, I'd have them stick their leg out, check their legs, make sure that I can feel the wings, they can move, everything is correct. Now, here's the last thing, groin protection. So groin protection is required in the SCA, but we also have the things about gender and different issues along there. You do not ask, do you have your cup in or whatever? Make no assumptions. You just ask the person, do you have the appropriate groin protection? And leave it at that. It's either a yes or a no. I know this should seem as a no brainer, but if I ever see a cup check somebody, we're gonna have a problem. Because I have seen people with their marshal staff no, no, that's not appropriate and it, it doesn't happen. So 
always remember that, you know, we, we have to be respectful to each other. So again, minimal amount, either move or have them move to where you have to get to, to make sure that they're properly inspected, mindful of who they are as a person, ask only the things necessary. And if there's an issue, work with them to try and find a way to get them on the field, whether it's some duct tape, some string, hey, I'm a little concerned about this, can you fix this? Your, your helm doesn't go down far enough. Can you put a little piece of leather down here so you don't take it in the chin with a sword? That's the things that we need to focus on. Most times when you're in a tournament, somebody has got material that they can use to help get the people on the, the field. Again, sometimes you have to tell them you can't play until you get it fixed. You're going to have people that are going to want to argue with you about what's right and what isn't. That's where you need that paper hard copy. And don't be afraid to get a second opinion. And if a fighter doesn't like what you're saying, don't get mad. Just push it up the line. That's what, what the marshal in charge is for. If it has to go further, that's what the branch marshals are for. That's what the Armor combat marshal is for, that's what the Earl Marshal is for. We have a step-by-step -step process. That doesn't mean sit here and take a lot of crap from a fighter. If a fighter is giving you a bunch of grief and yelling at you, you need to say something about it because that's not appropriate either. Don't lose your cool right away if somebody goes, well, I don't agree with that, or you're wrong. If they think you're wrong, that's what paper's for. If it's not, hand them off to the MIC and let them deal with it. Let it go from there. And then just let it go. Go about your business and go on with your day. I think that gets most of it on a basic armor inspection. You're going to learn that a lot of it is common sense. A lot of it is knowing where to find the answers in the book. Just being mindful of what you're doing and respectful of the people that you're helping out. Most fighters are pretty good with the marshals because we know we don't get to play if you're not there doing the job. If you're not there, then somebody's got to take their gear off and marshal the field. We'll, we'll just kind of leave it at that for now. So we'll go over to our little makeshift Eric and I'll go over a few things about when you're marshaling a field. Most of the time, marshals always have a staff. About a foot and a half of it is colored with black and yellow. Those are the colors that signify a marshal. Normally, a junior is always going to be put with a senior with two people on the field, depending on the size and the amount of marshals. There are times where you're going to end up having to marshal a field by yourself. Myself, I kind of prefer to do it. Guys, we'll skip back for a minute here. I'm gonna, so here's some, here's some common mistakes that new marshals make. One is, we'll say that this rope is connected to another Eric right here. And they'll be marshaling the field and they'll get themselves all up like this and they're watching what's going on and they're not paying attention to the two fighters behind them they're about to run them over and the marshal over there can't yell hold it fast enough to keep you from getting run over. Never ever put your back to an active field. There's too much noise going on. There's too much action going on and you're not gonna catch what's going on until the last minute. The other one is you see marshals, they're dancing all around, they're doing all this stuff, they're getting on the ground, ch watching stuff. You don't need to be a jackrabbit to do marshaling. When I marshal, once I get done with the lay on, I park my butt in the doorway because this is the open spot. I'm out of the way of the fighters. I can see everything I can need to do 
and I can project any issue that I need to deal with. For the most part, there's only two things that a marshal really has to say while he's on the field. Lay on and hold if something goes wrong. Put yourself in a place to where you can see everything, but not get into a point where you're in a situation where you get yourself pinned into a corner and then you have to go diving out of the area because two fighters are about to run you over. You'll see fighters a lot of times, gentlemen, if you'll help me, they'll get to be like they're fighting appropriate distance and they're getting really close to those ropes and they're rolling around those ropes. Most fighters know where they're at. It's kind of a judgment call. If you're worried about them going out, then yell to hold. But don't be in an instance to where you want to call hold because a lot of good fighters, especially knights, would be really good about running that, that, down that Eric rope knowing that it's there. They're very good judges about the situational area that they're in. So if you feel that you have to, call hold, but don't panic if you naturally start seeing fighters get up close to the ropes. Now granted, both of the fighters here have sword and shields. You get into an area where one of the fighters has got something like this, then it's a much different aspect about the people outside watching the fight and the fighters inside. Because now you have a much greater extreme range that you have to worry about. So the people standing next to the field need to be more in attention where you need to help ask them to move back far enough so that you can be assured that they're not gonna get injured by the great weapons. Remember when you're on the field as a marshal, you're in charge of that field. When I step on here and I'm fighting, I put the fighters where I want them. I don't let them choose where they wanna go. They may say, well, the sun or anything. That's fine, you can move however you want to once the lay on's called. But I wanna be in a position that once I call lay on, I can get to where I wanna be. And then I stay there. The only time that I ever get in a position to where I really move out of the spot that I wanna be is if he was on his knees, he was in front of him, and I was in a position to where I was here and I couldn't see everything that was going on. Then I would move myself over into a position where I can see what I need to see to make sure that everybody's safe. Thank you. Other than that, keep that position and use your voice. Another thing you're gonna hear a lot of stuff is people behind you that are watching the fight going, can you move, hey, Marshall, move. That's your field. The only time I move for anybody is for the fighters consorts, the crown or the crown representatives. Anybody else, tough luck, they can move. I'm where I wanna be. I'm responsible for making sure that the fighters are safe and the people are safe. So don't be afraid to just tell them, nope, I can't do it or just don't say anything at all. This is your Eric, you're responsible for it. Always remember that when you come out and you take over a field or you're helping on the field, look at the terrain, look at how the field is laid out. Look and see if there's any gopher holes, any ruts, any rocks. How are the Eric ropes set up? Are you gonna have any issues with fighters tripping or falling and be ready to let them know? When the pageantry starts, when we go through all the stuff that's going on, the fighters come out, I get the fighters where I want them to be at. They say the names, be part of the pageantry. 
you know, they announced Fighter A, Fighter B, be a little part of it. Now, when you get ready to do the lay on, don't be offended if a fighter doesn't want to say anything. Fighters get into the moment and they have a tendency to not say anything. You're expecting them to say, I'm ready, and they may not. So the way I counteract that is I get out in the middle and I point at him. I'm looking dead at him. He sees me pointing at him. All he's got to do is nod, blink his eyes, whatever. I don't care. Say something to me. I know he's ready. I look over, do the same thing with my other opponent. He's ready at that point. Lay on! And they can go about the fight. And I'm going back to where I need to to be in there. Put yourself in the fighters in a situation where everything can be the safest as possible and move the fight on as quick as possible. Because if you're helping marshal a crown tournament that's got 80 to 100 fighters in it, it's a long day. If you're out helping marshaling, don't be afraid to take a break. Don't be afraid to ask for water. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I got to go get lunch. I need to use the bathroom. Don't stay out there all day and kill yourself. It is an important part of the fighting and the pageantry we do. Everything from the fighters to the heralds to the marshals. Every bit of this is what makes the magic happen. So... For those who are wanting to and willing to get into this, thank you very much. As a person who's been on the high side of this job, it's very meaningful. So I think that goes over most of the basics of what it is to get started it. with what I've went over. Most everybody can start out as a junior marshal and come out and start getting on the field and helping out. Again, there's always people that can answer more questions for you, give you more training, and I will be working with their excellencies of Terra Primaria to try to get more martial training coming on and more extensive um, when we have a greater amount of time. Um, for anybody that's watching, if there's any more questions, otherwise I think we have covered most of it. Anyone else? Uh, All right. All right. That's a good one to go over. So one last thing that Baron Duncan said is is talking to you about corkscrewing. So if a fighter is on his knees, you can be just in normal fighting position and Duncan starts to walk around him to where he has to move to stay in front is considered corkscrewing and is illegal in there. There's also, on tier has a rule called the plane of the knees where once you, when the fighter is on his knees and the other fighter is up, the fighter standing, if he takes a step past the plane of the person on the ground's knees, he gets one shot and then he has to come back up. So as a marshal, you may have to remind somebody about the plane of the knee rule, um, but that is something that's more based on the fighters. So something like that. Yeah, or in between the, in between the knees. Now, of course, now, of course, if the opponent has the ability to go back onto his shoulders, and not too many people do, then the shoulders on the ground become the plane and the knees do, are not. So, but yes, those are a couple of the small things that they had um, to be aware of when you're on the field. Good? All righty. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. So what about articulated gauntlets? Oh, finger gauntlets. Yeah. Finger gauntlets? <laughs> oh, finger gauntlets. So, finger gauntlets. So, 
with finger gauntlets, finger gauntlets should cover the thumb completely and they have to come down enough to where they'll cover the finger. They also, there's not a real specific on it, but most of the time you should have them padded because the crushing effect of the metal on the finger a lot of times can break your hands. Finger gauntlets are kind of a gray area um, because they're not specifically called out in the ABCs, but they're not illegal either. It's whether or not that they cover your hands in the protection required by what you can find in the ABCs. So with like these, the mitten ones, he's got a full thumb covering and he's got a deal here so that when the hand closes, you can't hit any of the fingers, it's covered. So the, the finger gauntlets would have to have the same type of protection is what you're looking here. And the only way to do that is to really bring it to where it's at least half to three quarters of the way down the side of your fingers. If it's just covering the tops, that's not enough because there's no protection on the side of the fingers or the side of the hand. And anything that isn't covering this whole joint in here wouldn't, wouldn't be, in my opinion, a legal pair of, of uh, gauntlets to wear on the field. Good? All right, sold Americans. Thank you again for, for joining us and teaching this class. And um, thank you everyone who has come to our class tonight. And we will go ahead and sign off now. And um, we'll see you all later.